Coming up. Our goal is clear, to wipe Israel off the map. Inside a war that saved the nation. We want me to plan an entire war in two days. And fulfilled prophecy yes. along the way. Let uh, the world to see it, what we came through. Get an in-depth look at the Six-Day War. We don't glorify war. This is Israel. We glorify life. And the new film, In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem. It only took them four hours to fight the Battle of Ammunition Hill. It took us 26 hours to film it. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. For today's top headlines, let's go to the CBN News Desk. Gordon, President Trump's decision to pull the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Agreement quickly received mixed reactions, with Democrats and international leaders upset, but Republicans supporting it. Gary Lane has the story. When President Trump announced this on Thursday, The United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. The reaction from many U.S. Democratic politicians, world leaders, and Hollywood elites almost seemed like the president's decision would lead to the end of the world. It is a huge mistake, and future generations will look back on this day as one of the worst things that's happened in the 21st century. The rest of the world um, no longer respects the United States. Uh, this is the biggest issue in the world to most of the countries that have signed this agreement. They expect the United States to be the leader and not the laggard. The president opened up the possibility of renegotiating the agreement, but the leaders of France, Germany, and Italy say that can't be done. Here in the U.S., so far 10 governors and more than 60 mayors say they plan to honor and uphold the commitments made in the 2015 Paris Accord. The president said he made his decision because the industry restrictions mandated by the accord would harm American businesses and workers by making them less competitive in global markets. I was elected to represent the citizens of Pittsburgh, not Paris. Many Republicans on Capitol Hill were supportive of the U.S. pullout. Among them, House Speaker Paul Ryan praised the presidential action, saying, quote, the Paris Climate Agreement was simply a raw deal for America, signed by President Obama without Senate ratification. It would have driven up the cost of energy, hitting middle-class and low-income Americans the hardest. And from the coal state of Kentucky, Senator Rand Paul, who tweeted, This action by Donald Trump is great news for the economy and could save as many as 6 million U.S. jobs. This retired coal miner from West Virginia said it was a big day for coal. He's keeping his promise that he's going to help get the coal jobs back, help people get back to work. And uh, that's what we need in, anywhere in this country. You can go to Detroit, you can go to uh, Pennsylvania, you can go to West Virginia, there's people been laid off for years and it's been forgotten. Gary Lane, CBN News. President Trump won't be moving the U.S. Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv, at least for now. The White House says the president made the decision to maximize the chances of a peace deal between Israel and Palestinians. But the administration also emphasized that the move is only a delay and that the question is not if the president moves the embassy, but when. The military in the Philippines is trying to recapture a city from rebels with ties to ISIS. CBN's Lucille Toulousen brings us that story. The Philippine military is waging an all-out war against the ISIS-linked Mauti group in Marawi, Mindanao. Security forces are trying to liberate the sea city from the terrorists by launching surgical airstrikes. Tragically, 10 soldiers were killed recently when an army plane accidentally bombed Philippine troops. The soldiers were positioned close to where the terrorists were holed up. Sporadic gunfire and airstrike bombs can be heard from where I am standing. Now this village has turned into a ghost town and this is part of the 85% of Marawi City that is now under the control of government troops. But as the government forces continue to advance in fighting against the Mauti group, their main concern is the safety of the trapped residents and hostages that these terrorists are using as human shields. 
Our mandate, just remember the mandate of your troops on the ground is to neutralize and destroy the remaining local terrorist groups and be able to rescue the trapped uh, civilians in the hostile area. Since the beginning of this war against the Islamic extremists on May 23rd, the number of internally displaced persons has risen to 200,000, which is two-thirds of Marawi City's population. Evacuees like Lailani are now suffering the brunt of the Marawi crisis. She said many people feared getting caught in the crossfire, so they left their homes and all their belongings in order to save their lives. We were so scared, especially for the safety of my baby. And so on the second day, we hired a jeepney to be able to escape from the crossfire. Lucille Talusan, CBN News, Marawi City, Philippines. Those are today's top stories from CBN News. Now let's go back over to Terry. Up next, actors from In Our Hands reveal what it was like working on this epic film. It was like unbelievable that I'm playing like the one that released the city and take it back. When, uh, it's the place with that my grandfather used to be here, like, you know, unprotected. Why they say this film hits close to home, that's next. This month is the 50th anniversary of Israel's Six-Day War. To commemorate this historic event, CBN released a documentary called In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem. It's the story of Israel's defense forces and how they risked everything for the sake of their homeland. We worked with over 200 actors and extras, and Ephraim Graham asked some of them how it felt taking part in the role of a lifetime. We shall destroy Israel and its inhabitants. Our goal is clear, to wipe Israel off the map. I believe the time has come to begin a battle of annihilation. Arab nations surrounded Israel in 1967. The Jewish nation's survival hinged on a war that would last only six days. Those days are relived in the film, In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem through the compelling stories of Israeli paratroopers. If you live here, you won't be coming back. But if I don't leave, none of you will be coming back. Production for In Our Hands took just under a year to complete, and one of the most pivotal battle scenes was shot right here at Ammunition Hill. We did the shooting on this, uh, this Jeep right here. This was actually originally uh, Motagur's uh, Jeep, the uh, character played by uh, Sharon. On location and, uh, at Ammunition Hill, we so talked with actors experience. Idan Barkai and Sharon Friedman. My grandfather, uh, grandfather Aaron, was in the siege on Jerusalem before, and he was telling about it for me, uh, to me when I was young. And it was like, you know, it's like unbelievable that I'm playing like the one that, uh, you know, released the city and take it back, when, uh, which is the place with that my grandfather used to be here, like, you know, unprotected. Sharon plays so 55th Brigade Commander Motagur. Idan plays Chief Intelligence Officer Arik Akman. You want me to plan an entire war in two days? Yes. I'm at the university full time. I'm about to take my final exam. So? You'd better get to work. Both of these gentlemen, very impressive uh, in terms of their lives and they're real life people. Yeah. Were you nervous about portraying people who people celebrate and are heroes? Mm. You feel obligated uh, to honor that uh, person, but uh, it's just Arik Achmon is such a great person. I'm, uh, I'm, I was humbled, you know, I, tr I just tried to do my best try to uh, give out the emotion and the tension uh, of, the, say, of this, the moment I was in. Me, myself, I served the army, but I never really fought in uh, big, great wars, uh, fortunately. This film hits close to home for many cast members. I myself was in the army in the paratroopers, so I could give my input 
to the parts and the movie, but it was uh, more real than just a, a, a memory to, of the Israel uh, history. Ishai Ben Moshe plays 71st Battalion Commander Yoram Zamosh. This being such a critical part of, of this country's history, what was it about the story and retelling it that made you want to be a part of it? This is the first time I'm here since uh, I was in the army. Yeah, so it's very special for me. I'm very honorable to do it, first of all, to be part of it and uh, to let uh, people in the world to see it, what we came through. Were there any scenes that were difficult for you uh, or the most memorable scene for you, what was it? The most memorable was uh, with the, uh, the actress Saud Farhi, who plays the woman that gives me the flag of Israel to put on the wall. It was a very emotional uh, scene. This flag flew in the old city before we left in 1948. When you get to the wall, I want you to hang this flag. Of course. It will be our honor. Action! Guiding these emotional scenes, producer and director Aaron Zimmerman. The battle scenes that we see um, are gripping. That process, how hard was it to reenact and, and make that come alive on, on film? It took an enormous team of people. We had, um, we did many scouts of this place. My director of photography and I, we came here several times and we would literally walk the battlefield, walk the trenches and say, okay, we have this scene, can we do this here? Let's do it up here. We took every angle into account. We had a joke on our set. It, it only took them four hours to fight the Battle of Ammunition Hill. It took us 26 hours to film it. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, this being a film about war, um, there is a lot of darkness in it. Um, but I felt like there's also a lot of light in the film as well. It was intentional to end on a high note, but it was also my intention not to give an empty, hey, yay, war, we won, because there was so much, there were so many casualties. Absolutely. And there were so many injuries and people who both mentally and physically were never the same after that war. War has a price and nobody wants war. And one of my favorite things is what Alon Wald, who runs Ammunition Hill, mm -hmm. whose father was killed in the Battle of Ammunition Hill. One of my favorite parts of the film is what he says. He said, you know, this isn't Sparta. We don't glorify death. We don't glorify war. This is Israel. We glorify life. And I think that's what I wanted to come out of this film. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Jerusalem. Certainly the most significant war, the most significant battle of my lifetime. Tremendous victory against all odds. Israel won. Outnumbered, outgunned, facing four different armies, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt and an incredible victory and a victory that fulfilled biblical prophecy. Uh, how many wars can you say that of? Here, the promise that God gave to Israel that one day they'd be back in the land and not just in the land, but Jerusalem would be the capital of Israel once again. Well, if you want to own a copy of In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem, it's now available on DVD. All you have to do to order is call us, 1-800-700-7000, and you can get a copy for a gift of $15 or more. So if you'd like to own the DVD, call us right now, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Still ahead, a part of the story you didn't see in theaters, how Israeli jets wiped out the Egyptian Air Force. We were told in the briefing before the takeoff, there is no mercy, there is only one thing, Keep on doing the job. Hear from the pilots who took part in Operation Focus. That's next.
In the days before the Six-Day War, the Israeli Air Force realized it needed to take out the Egyptian Air Force. They planned an attack called Operation Focus, and it has since been called the most successful air campaign in military history. Take a look. In May of 1967, Egypt's president, Gamal Abdel Nasser, declared war on the state of Israel, telling his followers, our path to Palestine will be covered with blood. Nasser moved his troops into the Sinai Peninsula, expelled the UN peacekeepers there, then blocked the Straits of Tehran to Israeli ships. For Israel, it was time to strike or be struck. And for the next three weeks, the Israel Defense Forces were on high alert. The atmosphere in Israel before the war was very tense. People thought we were facing total extinction. 40,000 coffins were prepared, and no one was sure that the IDF could really handle the Arab armies. Two weeks after the birth of my son, I had to leave him without knowing if I would ever see him again. Armed by the Soviet Union, the Egyptians had the largest and best air force in the Arab world. Israel's only chance of survival was a preemptive strike. And the air force had prepared for this moment for more than a decade. Their plan was called Operation Moked, which means focus in Hebrew. Operation Moked was the brainchild of Ezra Reitzman was commander of the Israeli Air Force. He was a pilot himself. He was, a, he was a pilot in the British Air Force in World War II, flew Spitfires, later the president of Israel. And it was an incredibly daring program. The plan was for dozens of squadrons to strike 11 airfields throughout Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula. The main goal was to strike when all the Arab planes were still on the ground, fully exposed. And the idea was to bomb out the runways first to prevent any aircraft from taking off and to keep them from flying for a few days. In 1966, the plan's creator, Ezra Weizmann, had been promoted to IDF Chief of Operations. And his successor, General Moti Hod, now had the task of executing Weizmann's plan. Moti was a commander of the Air Force that kept on flying as a fighter. He understood what we felt in the cockpit. So he understood the issues. Brave man, the nicest person in the world. He had nerves from a metal and always thinking forward ahead like he did on the time to attack Egypt. For Israeli civilians, the pre-war tension was high. But for Air Force Squadron Commander Yalo Shavit, Israel's victory was inevitable. The Israeli Air Force is like a tide spring, ready to somebody to cut the cable that prevented it from. It will be done in no time because we have been trained since the last 11 years. I told my wife, go to Gedera. Gedera is a small village in the south. Find a small toferet, a lady tailor. And you know, what do you want to wear for parties with all the Uzunus, prime minister and down? Have three sets. Why three? I said, because I'm telling you to do three. There will be parties. He says, you're crazy. I said, listen to me, go and do this. She did it. She was the best woman dressed in the parties. Israeli intelligence had spent years gathering details about the Egyptian targets. From the location of each plane, to the name, rank, and even the voice of each pilot. I was one of the youngest pilots in the Air Force. 
I had graduated from pilot training the year before the war. I wasn't even 21 years old yet. I was the intelligence officer of the squadron. For three weeks, we learned the most accurate intelligence we could learn. We also prepared the combat doctrine for attacking airports. I was a part of that system. It was so confident that they know exactly what to do. They trained so many times, they knew it with closed eyes. To receive an aircraft with empty fuel tanks, with empty munition, with empty f whatever. And they got to a record of eight minutes. Eight minutes to prepare the aircraft to be ready to take off. Monday morning, the 5th of June, they woke us up and we went down to the base. We knew that the big moment had arrived. The commander of the Air Force came in with the wing commander and they said, Dear friends, Operation Focus will start today at 7.45 a.m. sharp. This is a fateful operation. Friends of yours will be injured and killed in battle right next to you. It is going to be tough, but we will make it. Then the wing commander told us that the fate of the Jewish people was on our shoulders. We were not afraid for ourselves. The only fear was that we would not be able to perform our duties in the best way possible. When I took off, I didn't realize it would be, it would be such a complicated mission. Squadron leaders gave their pilots some ground rules, issued by Commander Motihod. There is no communication whatsoever. No radio, no nothing. So we were prepared with all kinds of signs and flags, colors of the flags. When you were ready to start the engine, where you have to take off, no radio, zero. You fly at zero altitude, the lowest you can. If something happened, you do not report back that you crashed or that you jump, the Air Force will find you. You do whatever it takes to reach to the target. We have to destroy the aircraft on the ground. We were also told that the mission was more important than anything, and that even in an emergency, even if a friend of ours is about to be killed, we were not allowed to warn him. We had to just let him crash. As cruel as that may sound, this was all so that we will not disrupt the operation. If someone is attacked, you have to go on and fight. Nearly all of Israel's 196 combat planes were committed to the airstrike. Only 12 were left behind to defend the state of Israel. The planes flew low over the Mediterranean to avoid being detected by radar. We took off and stayed between 35 feet to 50 feet. Impossible below that. We smelled the smell of the salt over the sea. I was assigned to the foursome that was under Yalo's leadership. I was number two in the squadron, and our mission was to attack the end slash field near Cairo. Egypt's radar didn't pick them up, but someone else did. At 8.15 Egyptian time, Jordanian radar screens lit up with an unusual concentration of planes heading over the Mediterranean. And from there, a series of mistakes gave the Israelis an overwhelming advantage. The top general in Jordan radioed the word grape, the prearranged code for war, to Egypt's defense minister in Cairo. But the Egyptians had changed the code word the day before without updating Jordan. So the Jordanians' messages were tossed aside and the warning never reached Cairo. But even if the message had been deciphered, there was no one around to read it. Egypt's Air Force commander was at his daughter's wedding. The ground force commander was on vacation and the defense minister had gone to bed a few hours earlier leaving orders that he was not to be disturbed. Egypt's chief of staff, Field Marshal Amer, was flying in that morning from an all-night party. So, at the first sign of trouble, the Egyptians shut down their entire air defense system. 
worried that Amir's plane might be shot down by mistake. Assuming that any Israeli attack would begin at sunrise, the Egyptians had already flown their dawn patrols and returned to base for breakfast. Moti was the man that planned it, caused the soldiers and officers to be creative. He hit them exactly in the middle of landing, refueling, eating, ready to go here. Boom. We reached the target, but from a distance of uh, three, four minutes, I saw that there was a fog. So I started circling, finding a hole in this fog that I see the runway. I dive, I bomb the runway, everything was okay. Two is okay. Three, I don't hear anything. Four is okay. Something happened to this excellent officer and pilot that he tried to aim, and meantime, he lost altitude. And when he tried to recover, he hit the runway. But as we were told in the briefing before the takeoff, there is no mercy, there is no... Uh, there is only one thing, keep on doing the job. We turned around 360 degrees and performed the second attack. The planes were already burning and there was a lot of smoke. Those bombers went up in giant flames. First I attacked a bomber that seemed to be less damaged. Then the second time I attacked an anti-aircraft battery and then finally the control tower. The Egyptians fired some anti-aircraft missiles at my plane, but they did not hit me. In the last second I saw from the left anti-aircraft position and before I knew what happened, I got a hit by three, four bullets. The front wheel, I saw it disappear. The aircraft stopped, my air brakes went out and from 500 knots, it went down to 220 in no time. The two other, number two and four, whoosh, flew forward, I gave them an order, go by yourself to the base. Get as soon as possible to the sea, so nobody will shoot at you. So I found myself, after I was hit, at 3,000 foot, looking forward. And what do I see? MiG-21, in front of me, maybe 500 meters, shooting. My instinct immediately is to shoot at him. He broke to the right, I broke to the left, and then close to Israel, I went up to 7,000 in case I bail out. I came to the area of the base, Benny Pellet, the commander of the base in the control tower. Hello, you have a problem, I understand. Uh, go to the sea uh, next to Ashdod and bail out. He says, no. He says, I'm telling you, he says, I hear you. But I know I'm not going to bail out. I said, don't worry. I will land on one third of the runway toward the, the fence. So I came there. I hold the aircraft in the lowest speed I can. And I crossed the runway. I touched full brakes. I saw a lot of pieces of fire from the both sides. I crossed the runway, I went to the overrun, a lot of stones and all this, and it stopped. And I went out and I was standing and I saw the security and the emergency, emergency uh, cars. And uh, they were so excited where is the pilot? Because they thought that something happened because of the dust and all this. There was no fire because there was no fuel. I came with zero fuel. Zero fuel. Nothing in the aircraft, in the tanks. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Gradually, the rest of the first wave returned to Israel. In less than eight minutes, the planes were refueled, rearmed, and ready for a second wave of bombing. In just over half an hour, the Egyptians had lost 204 planes, 
half of their air force. The Israelis had lost only 19. The kill ratio of Operation Focus had exceeded expectations by almost 100%. At half past 10, General Moti Hod turned to the army's chief of staff, Yitzhak Rabin, and announced, the Egyptian Air Force has ceased to exist. The Jordanian and Syrian Air Forces had also been decimated. After less than five hours, the Israelis had complete air superiority over the Middle East. It is truly a Hail Mary operation, but for the Egyptians, it's the ultimate humiliation. And very shortly after the Israeli aerial strike, Israeli ground forces began moving into Sinai. The goals were very limited, very limited. The Egyptians had three defense lines in Sinai. The goal was to take out the first of the three defense lines, not beyond that. But the Egyptian army collapsed so fast and began running away that the other defense lines crashed. And then, as I said earlier, Israeli forces reached the Suez Canal without even intending to reach the Suez Canal. They got sucked into Sinai. So for the Egyptians, this was the ultimate humiliation. It cannot be that the people who just yesterday you had pledged to throw into the sea uh, are now driving you across the Suez Canal. All day long, the Egyptian propaganda machine ran in overdrive. Radio Cairo falsely reported that Egypt had shot down 85 Israeli planes, while only losing two of their own. And Field Marshal Amer told the Jordanians that Israel had lost 75% of its air power, a lie that encouraged Jordan's King Hussein to enter the war. So you have to develop a big lie. And the lie is that just the opposite has happened, that the, Israeli, that the Egyptian Air Force has surprised the Israeli Air Force on the ground and destroyed the Israeli Air Force, that the Egyptian army has crossed in the border into Israel and is on the outskirts of Tel Aviv. That's the big lie. And this big lie is believed by 200 million Arabs. No one questions you know, the credibility, no one questions the veracity of these claims. And you know, there's a certain debate about the degree to which Nasser himself understood or was informed of the direness of the situation. How would you like to be the officer who walked in and said, uh, President Nasser, I got some bad news for you? How would you like to be that person? So maybe people were feeding him strange information. There was one, um, one document I saw in Egypt was that the person who reported the Egyptian victory over the Israeli Air Force was a young Air Force captain by the name of Hosni Mubarak. Operation Focus remains one of the most successful air campaigns in military history. During the Six-Day War, the Israeli Air Force destroyed 452 enemy planes, while losing just 46 of their own. After their stunning performance in Egypt, Yaloshavit and his crew finished the day in Jerusalem, bombing the Jordanian tanks that raced towards the city and providing air cover for Israeli ground forces. It was a long day. That night, I came back to the room alone because my roommate got killed that day. It was an exhausting day, both physically and mentally. Not all was taken for granted even with the feeling of victory we had. No one was free to celebrate. When I think about it now, after years of experience, I still think that this was a very successful mission. If one will ask me uh, uh, what was the thing which uh, made it possible so successful, I would uh, answer, answer it in one word, simplicity. I know that there is a lot of stories about secret weapons which we used, and, uh, but we didn't actually, we, we used the spirit, we used the, the standard of flying, and we used another thing which maybe doesn't exist in any other air forces in the world, and uh, we call it the no alternative. And uh, we, when you don't have alternatives, you can achieve such achievements as we did in this war. They don't know what a group of dedicated people, professionals, trained, willing to invest their soul and everything they have can do for a country. It is an amazing story. And 
you know, it's an opportunity for you to have your copy of it. I think it's really quite astonishing. The story of Operation Focus is included as a DVD extra in the home release of In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem. If you'd like to get your copy, you can call this toll-free number. It's 1-800-700-7000. And you can own this movie, which... Uh, really tells the story of an amazing portion of history for a gift of $15 or more. It's a wonderful thing for you to own, um, wonderful thing to show others, to show your children, to show others who uh, haven't found out about this yet. But it's quite a production, and we want you to be able to have it. Gordon? Well, up next, a young girl who was smuggled from house to house just to keep hidden from the Nazi SS. She shares her story up next. Still ahead. We heard Germans yelling orders. A Jewish girl who was sent to Auschwitz. If there was ever a hell on earth, this must be it. And experimented on by Nazi doctors. He murdered our families. Her story. I spoiled the experiment. I survived. Later on today's show. Welcome back to the 700 Club. The Trump administration is asking the Supreme Court to reinstate the president's executive order on travelers from six countries that pose a terror threat. The White House says the U.S. will be safer with the policy put in place. Iran, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen are included on the list. The Justice Department argues that the Federal Appeals Court in Richmond made several mistakes in ruling against the order. Immigration officials would have 90 days to decide what changes are necessary before people may resume applying for visas. Operation Blessing is helping to get safe water to people on an island in Peru built from floating reeds. The community is surrounded by water, but none of it is safe to drink. One of the biggest concerns was children who lacked water in their classrooms. So Operation Blessing gave Clarity water purifiers made by Kohler to every classroom, giving students access to safe water. The small units filter out more than 99% of bacteria and provide up to 40 liters of safe water every day. You can find out more about Operation Blessing by going to their website at ob.org. Gordon and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, today, many Holocaust survivors in Israel live in poverty. And CBN Israel is there to meet the needs of these elderly people, from food to medical care, and weekly visits to keep them company as well. Take a look. Ines Gerskaya often spends her days alone in her apartment in Safed, Israel. She's a Holocaust survivor from Belarus. Her earliest memories are of Nazi tanks and her mother's last words. Bombs were falling as we ran, and the city was on fire. A young boy was killed right in front of me. I remember my mother stopped, hugged me, and said, I will not see you again. I only understood what that meant later. Her mother was taken away by Nazis, shot and killed. She and her three siblings survived as orphans in a ghetto in Minsk. We were constantly hungry. Our clothes were rags and we had no shoes. To this day, I still have problems with pain in my feet from running through the broken streets and the snow. She survived with the help of a Christian man. He smuggled her from house to house in the back of a horse-drawn cart as the Nazi SS hunted Jews in hiding. That man took a great risk. He saved my life. Years after the war, Ennis moved to Israel to begin a new life. When I met her, I could see she still carries the pain of everything she went through. It's difficult to walk sometimes, and the winters are especially hard on me. I am cold, and my feet ache so much. So CBN bought Ennis a foot spa and soaking salts from the Dead Sea. I love the foot bath. It's very soothing and helps relieve the pain. It was very sweet of you to give that to me. 
I feel like I could run a marathon. CBN Israel also got in a supportable heater she can keep next to her in the winter. We take her groceries every week to make sure she eats well and to keep her company. The good food helps so much and it means even more that it's brought by people who care about me. Thank you very much for all you do for me and the other survivors. You're keeping our memories alive so that our stories are not just pages in a history book. You can be a part of it. You can be a part of everything we're doing in Israel, whether it's the news stories you're seeing from our news bureau in, in Jerusalem to helping Holocaust survivors to helping new immigrants coming and making Aliyah to Israel to doing these wonderful documentaries. You can be a part of it by designating a gift to CBN Israel. How do you do it? Well, you pick up the phone and call us, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to give to CBN Israel. And for any amount, you'll have the uh, assurance that those who are blessing Israel, God will bless you. I will bless those who bless you. That's the promise over Abraham and his descendants, and you can walk in that promise. So do it now, 1-800-700-7000, or you can write to us at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463, or you can go to the website, cbn.com, and on the giving page, there's a place where you can designate your gift to CBN Israel. Do it now. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, Eva is also a Holocaust survivor. Last month, she was given the Sachem Award, the state of Indiana's highest honor. During World War II, Eva was a prisoner in a Nazi concentration camp. And years after she escaped, she was still haunted by that experience. Eva Moses and her twin sister Miriam grew up in a small village in Romania in the 1940s. Theirs was the only Jewish family in the region. My father said that as long as you said your prayers, did the good deeds that God wanted you to do, and we lived so far away from a big city that somehow we would escape. The Nazis won't come here for six Jews. But they did come. At the age of 10, Eva was loaded onto a crowded cattle car with her family and relocated to Auschwitz. The cattle car doors opened. We heard a lot of Germans yelling orders. My mother was holding on to Miriam and me. My father was standing right by us with my two older sisters. Very unfriendly sight. Everything seemed to be dark gray, tall barbed wire, strange, very, very menacing looking. I saw to myself, if there was ever a hell on earth, this must be it. My father and my two older sisters disappeared in the crowd. And 30 minutes after we stepped down, Miriam and I had no longer had a family. We were all alone in this place where there was nowhere to turn for help. Eva's experience, her first night in Auschwitz, prepared her for what she would face throughout her imprisonment. But there were the scattered, naked corpses of three children. Their bodies were shriveled. And this is when I realized at age 10 that that could happen to Miriam and me also, unless I did something to prevent it. Why did they do something to stay alive? I will not let that happen to Miriam and me. And the only thing that I could think of that I was going to make a silent pledge to do everything within my power that Miriam and I shall not end up on that filthy latrine floor. Eva's pledge would be tested over and over again throughout her captivity by Dr. Joseph Mengele, the notorious angel of death of Auschwitz. We knew from within the first week probably that he murdered our families. We also knew we were alive only because he wanted us alive, and as long as he wanted us alive. 
Mangala performed horrific experiments on his victims, studying the effects of drugs and poisons on twins, using one as the human guinea pig, the other as the control. Doctor injected us three times a week with all kind of germs and drugs and chemicals. After one of those injections, I became unbelievably sick. So next morning, Dr. Mengele came in with four other doctors, and he said, she has only two weeks to live. I refused to accept his verdict. For the next two weeks, Eva was in and out of consciousness, often waking up on the floor, crawling towards a water faucet, never making it. But somehow, she continued to survive. I actually made a pledge that I refuse to die, and I will do anything in my power to prove Dr. Mengele wrong, to survive, and to be reunited with my sister. Would I have died, she would have been rushed to Mengele's lab and killed. But I spoiled the experiment. I survived. After nine months of experiments in captivity, Eva and her sister were liberated from the horrors of Auschwitz by Russian troops. Though free, Eva was held captive by a different kind of prison, one of bitterness and unforgiveness. If anybody asked me if I was angry with God, I was angry with everything, and, ev and God, and the world, and everybody. She remained in her invisible cell until the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, while visiting the camp where so many horrible events shaped her life, Eva made another kind of pledge. She forgave. As I was standing by the ruins of the gas chamber, I was remembering all the people I was forgiving. I was forgiving the Nazis. I was forgiving Mengele. I was forgiving the people who did the experiments. And I was forgiving everybody because the fact that I had the power to forgive gave me an emotional freedom that was so exhilarating, so beneficial to me that I did not have to deal with who did what to me and why. Immediately, I felt that all that pain that I was carrying on my little shoulders were lifted from me, that I was free, that I was no longer a prisoner of my tragic past. Today, Eva runs her own Holocaust Museum in Terre Haute, Indiana, in the memory of her sister Miriam, who died of cancer in the 90s. She also shares her experiences from her time at Auschwitz and the lessons she learned on her path to forgiveness. God has the power to forgive and forgive us and forgive other people. Her message now is simple. Forgive even your worst enemies. I have personally experienced the act of forgiveness that gave me my emotional freedom. No human being can be free, emotionally free and mentally free without forgiving people who have wronged them. There are many horrific stories in the world, even in our world today, of people who have been wronged, maimed, lives that have been lost. And these stories from concentration camps in the Second World War just stay at the top of the list of people treated so horrifically for so long. You can understand why Eva carried that burden of bitterness and mistrust and hatred and unforgiveness. I mean, it's totally understandable. But what she says in the end that she discovered is so important for all of us to hear. There is a power in forgiveness, and it's a power that sets the one who forgives free. Maybe many things have happened in your life and been done to you that were not fair, that were not right, that were harmful, wounding, difficult. And today, in hearing Eva's story, I hope you understand that a decision has been set before you. You can continue to live under the harness of that because it really is a burden and you are harnessed to it. 
But here's the thing. You can choose today to come out from under it. You don't have to live with that anymore. One of the things that happens sometimes when the choice to forgive is presented to us is that we misunderstand that by forgiving, we are somehow exonerating the person or the circumstances that happened to us. It's not so at all. The person who harmed you doesn't even have to ask for forgiveness, want forgiveness. It's your choice what you do. Jesus perhaps paid the greatest price of anyone because he suffered so and died, having lived a life that was perfection. And he did it for you and for me so that we could be free, so that we could make this choice in our lives. He says, I came to set the captive free. That's your inheritance today. Will you receive it? That Jesus loved you so much that he gave everything that he had so that you could be free. Now walk in that today. Do what Eva did. Make a list of all those who have wounded or hurt you and then choose today. You have the power to make this choice. And when you make the choice to, to forgive any and all who've harmed you, you will come out from underneath that burden free, free to live the abundant life that Jesus said he created you for. Try it, try it, you'll like it. There's nothing worse than living under the shadow of unforgiveness and today you can be set free. If you'd like to know what the Word of God has to say about it, we've got a pamphlet called Forgiveness and it's yours for the asking. Just call our toll-free number 1-800-700-7000. We'll be happy to send this out to you. We wanna leave you today with words of encouragement from Psalm 2911. The Lord will give strength to His people. The Lord will bless His people with peace. Peace to you today in Jesus' name.